Coming up on Garden Talk. Having a diverse and healthy root zone ecology is like one of the non-essential elements of a growing that is probably one of the most essential things that we're learning. So like the environmental factors, your soil moisture content and you know the temperature of the room have a huge role to play in the nutrient uptake and transpiration ability of your plants. You know, your mineral nutrition, your, your nitrates, your phosphorus, your potassium, that is the same molecule regardless of bottle, salt, bran, country of origin, all of that. The plants are constantly evolving as we're growing them, you know, because they're not growing out in the wild, so their needs are going to evolve as well. So it's a, that's why I think things like leaf tissue testing, leachate testing are so important to really know what the plant's eating. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This episode number 95. In this episode, I interview Mike Chang. He works for Canna Cribs Consulting, and he does consulting for things such as IPM, plant nutrition, gaining efficiency in cultivations, and cultivation protocol planning. I narrow down the focus in this episode to proper nutrition for plants throughout their entire life. If you gain value from these podcast episodes, please click the like button and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That way you can be notified when new episodes are released. If you'd like to support even more, visit patreon.com slash mrgrowit. There are various rewards set up for those that support, and you can pledge any amount that you'd like. 100% of the money pledged through Patreon goes right back into the podcast. It helps this podcast keep going, so thank you so much for your support there. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free gardening information of all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. They now have humidifiers called the Cloud Forge. I've been using the Cloud Forge T3, which has a 4.5 liter capacity and can be filled from the top. It also includes a hose, so you can place the humidifier outside your grow tent and feed the hose into your grow tent, saving you precious space. It also connects to the Controller 69 Pro, so you can control it from your smartphone. I'll have a link in the description section below so you can learn more about their humidifiers and the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. And we're back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Mike Chang from Canna Cribs Consulting. How are you doing today? Hey, good. How are you, Chris? Good, good. Thanks for asking. So you and I have worked on some projects in the past, and I feel like it was just a few months ago where I was like, come on the podcast. Got to get you on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have so much good knowledge when it comes to horticulture. You have a ton of knowledge in plant nutrition, IPM, gaining efficiencies in cultivations, and cultivation protocol planning. So today I figured we'd focus in on plant nutrition I have yes. a bunch of good questions lined up for you, and I think this is going to bring a lot of value to the audience. But first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah, sure. So I guess I started everything after I got out of the military in 2010, and I started to grow at home in California. Uh, just kind of a hobbyist, but back then it was kind of Wild Westy, and you could sell your bud to co-ops and all that other stuff. So it was pretty fun. Um, and after that, I wanted to kind of get a, a, an education in agriculture and kind of do things a little bit more properly. So I went to the U of A in Arizona, and uh, while I was there, I got a really good internship at an ag company and pivoted into agriculture for a while. And so I was working in like uh, field corn, um, cotton, a lot of greenhouse stuff, so cucumbers, tomatoes. The uh, agricultural world in Arizona is pretty, pretty vast. So. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't short on work there, but I just got the itch to come back and that's when I got with Nate and uh, yeah, we started to just, uh, I started to work for him and we kind of built this consulting side. Awesome. So getting into plant nutrition, there are essential elements for plants and there are non-essential elements for plants. Talk to us about the essential elements for plants. Sure. So the common knowledge for most essential nutrients is going to be like your NPK, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and then you have your slew of micronutrients. The micronutrients, that's, uh, that's what we know as essential right now. Things like molybdenum, boron, iron, manganese, you know, the, the main usual suspects. But we're constantly learning about new roles that elements play in plants as we continue to study plants, which is 
kind of an interesting thing that you asked about non-essential elements. I mean, I can go over the essential elements first here. So like nitrogen, <clears throat> basic building block. That's going to be for all your amino acids, you know, um, all of the cell structures, things like that. So that's basic building blocks for tissues and chlorophyll. Your phosphorus is going to be mainly uh, your energy transport, things like it's moving in ATP, it's, it's uh, helping move um, metabolites across membranes, things like that. Potassium is going to be for your enzyme activation and to move sugars across the plant and for osmotic pressure. So those three things are the most used by the plant in addition to oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, of course. But uh, all the micronutrients play other roles in the plant. They're kind of like vitamins in humans, where we need carbs, fat, and protein, but we also need vitamins for all of our other functions. And the micronutrients like uh, calcium, sulfur, magnesium, those all fill that role. And so the micronutrients and the macronutrients would be considered your essential elements. And uh, we can go into any one of those in more detail. Okay, got it. And then for the non-essential elements for plants, I think one that comes to mind right away is silica, right? Although silica is essential in some plants, but not in the medicinal plant that we all know and love, right? Correct. However, the research is still out because what a lot of the current research on silica's role in a plant's metabolism now is finding is that <clears throat> not only is it kind of a uh, maybe not part of metabolism and it just gets deposited onto cell walls and that's why everyone knows that it's good to have silica in plants so that they don't get overfed on by bugs but silica actually plays a pretty important role in a lot of the metabolic pathways for biotic and abiotic stress in the plant whether it's drought or some sort of a pest like a chewing bug or even like a fungal pathogen so now that we're seeing that silica is involved in those metabolic pathways, a lot of those metabolic pathways we know are conserved in other plants and higher plants. So all it takes at this point is for us to connect the dots in the research to see how silica actually functions in the medicinal plants that we're typically trying to cultivate at large scale and then kind of have hard evidence for that. But now the kind of common knowledge is changing where silica is being considered a, a kind of an essential nutrient as far as making sure that a cultivation, whether it's field ag or indoor ag, is m maximizing its growing potential and w reducing its need for like pest control products by increasing the plant's natural resistance to things. What are some ways that folks can add in silica to the garden? I know like on the organic side of things, you got rice hulls. And then if you are growing with synthetic or a mineral-based it usually comes within a bottle, right? Usually it's what, uh, ortho silicic acid, I believe. Yeah, some sort of silicic acid, yeah. And those are all great sources. Silicic acids kind of work in the principle of like direct delivery or kind of uh, very close, as close to direct delivery as typically was uh, available. Um, other, potass other sources like potassium silicates kind of rely on your root zones ecology to make that silica available to the plant as well. Um, there's a newer technology out that certain companies like, I think, I know Ventana Plant Science is using it. It's a silica nanoparticle. So it's an SNP. And there's been research showing that silica particles under 20 micrometer or 20 microns in size can directly get um, uptaken into the plant. So there's, there's newer ways that we're finding to deliver silica into plants that are a little bit more efficient and won't really mess with mineral nutrition programs like potassium silicates and things like that would and are kind of... I use at a lower rate, so you don't have to use so much of it. That was my next question is what is like the application rate for silica? It, that is one of those gray areas where the research hasn't fully been elucidated yet for like things like medicinal plants or even some of our more major crops. We know that it does help. Um, there are certain set PPM guidelines or set application guidelines for certain products, but those are all based on a very narrow scope of research right now. So <clears throat> I think as we kind of like study it more, we'll find out the best way to the best way to apply and the best amounts to apply so that we're not kind of over applying because over applying fertilizers has kind of been one of the biggest issues right now in agriculture. So it's all about making sure that we're being as efficient as possible. That makes sense. What other non-essential elements are out there that you would recommend growers consider adding into the garden? 
Um, you know, as far as elements, I can't really think of like a, like a, I couldn't name like a metal that you should add, but there's certain aspects of plant cultivation that are lost on the purely mineral side of it. You can absolutely grow a plant in an inert environment with the right mineral nutrition, but there's certain things like making sure that your carbon to nitrogen ratio is correct, having added roots own ecology to help fixate more nitrogen out of the air, help fixate phosphorus that's in the soil that may have become immobilized. So I think having a diverse and healthy roots own ecology is like one of the non-essential elements of a growing that is probably one of the most essential things that we're learning. It's like the interactions that plants have with their roots own ecology and just the, the space around them that kind of helps them optimize their grow, growth or not. Yeah, the balance of elements within the medium is certainly important. You know, it's often said that medicinal plants require more nitrogen in the vegetation stage and more phosphorus and potassium in the flowering stage. Is that true science or bro science? <laughs> <laughs> it's fairly true science, yeah. I mean, the bros are, are right a lot of the times. They just haven't been validated yet, you know? That's the problem. Um, <clears throat> so the main reason why you want to add more nitrogen really to any growing plant is to increase the growth, to have more basic building materials for those building blocks, for those amino acids. So, And also um, high nitrogen delivery can signal things in the plants that kind of shift them to produce even more vegetative growth, more luxurious growth, to kind of be more hungry for other nutrients, which in turn adds to more growth. So higher nitrogen in earlier stages is typically recommended also because there's a lot of research out that directly correlates more plant biomass in the vegetative stage equating to more inflorescence or like more cut flower yield towards the end. So if you have more biomass in the beginning, if you can get more vigorous, healthy, fast growth in a shorter amount of time, usually with higher nitrogen rates, then that's what you'd opt for so that in flower you can get the most benefits from that veg time. And then as far as kind of shifting over into the phosphorus and potassium side, phosphorus definitely is required by the plant in, in really both stages, whether it's the vegetative or the flowering stage, because like we talked about, one of the main reasons why the plant needs phosphorus is for that energy transport and for its metabolism. We don't want the plant to be bottlenecked by phosphorus during those critical stages in flower where we're pumping secondary metabolites or we're trying to increase cell density in flowers, things like that. So <clears throat> phosphorus can be very important in those later stages and you might want to add like a PK boost so you make sure that phosphorus isn't your bottleneck. Now the jury is a little bit out on potassium. There's been a couple of research um, studies done on how potassium kind of affects and it seems affects the growth of medicinal plants or even other cultivars of just kind of flowering plants there seems to be a range that like medicinal plants can tolerate when it comes to potassium which is actually a pretty wide range and there has been research that shows that it's almost maybe cultivar specific there's outliers within research that show like you know we didn't really get any results off of high or low potassium in these in this study except for this one strain where you know higher potassium gave bushier growth, uh, larger fan leaves, things like that. So we're we're seeing that it's a little bit cultivar specific when it comes to potassium, but the phosphorus definitely you don't want that to be a bottleneck. So you do want to make sure that you're applying enough, and um, and you do want to make sure that you are applying enough phosphorus in the beginning stages where you need those roots and shoots because it is um, very important in that new growth as well. But it's also important in energy transport later on down the line where the plant is having a lot of secondary metabolite actions and it needs to move a lot of things throughout the plant and it requires energy to do so. So yeah, phosphorus is definitely important later on in flower, but you definitely don't want to over apply something like phosphorus. You want to do things like maybe leaf tissue testing to make sure that you're doing the right amounts. So when you're growing hydroponically, it's a little bit easier to precision feed and get certain ratios of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, so on and so forth, right? But how about the folks that are growing with bottles, synthetics, right? How, how do they control that? How do they ensure that they're not, that the medium is balanced with the proper elements throughout the entire plant's life? So with keeping your NBK balance, you really have to kind of defer to the manufacturer's specs on whatever nutrient you're using. Um, 
that's why they'll usually break it off into like a nitrate bottle or like a, a CalMag bottle, things like that, so that you can play with those numbers. If you wanted to get hard data, of course, you would do things like leaf tissue testing, which honestly is available to the home growers nowadays. You can just mail in your samples. But if you didn't want to get that kind of uh, granular and that focused on it, what you'd want to do is kind of just look at the numbers on your bottles and then just do the math on what you're putting down in that gallon or so of water that you're applying to your plants. And then <clears throat> at that point, you can be assured that you have at least those numbers. I kind of call that the shotgun approach. You have at least those set numbers that you're delivering to the plant so that if the conditions are right enough, the plant will use those nutrients in that ratio. The big thing is testing your leachate. A lot of the larger plant cultivators out there will test the water that's leaching out of their substrate so they, they can actually know, hey, this is too high in phosphorus so we can lower our phosphorus. Hey, we can do this or that. Barring that, you really just have to trust the ratios that the manufacturers provided and then you have to make sure you're just doing good watering and fertigation practices like getting your runoffs, um, making sure that you're applying evenly throughout your substrate, things like that. That's pretty straightforward. Let's not forget about organic cultivators, the folks that are adding in organic inputs. Some people might be listening to this and be like, balance? I just add it on top and let the plant uptake as it as it needs to. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, is the plant in fact uptaking what it needs when it needs and leaving behind in the medium what it doesn't need? Technically, yes. I mean, that's that's what plants do, you know. But with organic um, production, it's kind of a it's a slow burn. It's like barbecue. You can't really know what you're putting on the plant every day and what's being taken up. You're putting on basically as much as you think you need for the, for a set amount of time. And then in that time, you're hoping that your plant doesn't run into a deficiency. And by the time you reapply, you're hoping that you don't have an accumulation of that particular thing, like say nitrogen. So with organic production, you, you really have to know your cultivars. That's one big thing. Like all these great producers and tomato producers that are doing it outdoors and organically, they're doing it with cultivars that they know exactly how to run and they know exactly what the nutri nutritional needs are in the different life stages. So if, if you know your cultivars that well, then it's fairly easy to plan your applications of organic nutrients. If not, then you kind of, again, do like a shotgun approach in your media where you add as much as you think you need that plant's going to need for a set amount of time and then you reapply after that time has expired, ideally doing leaf tissue tests. A lot of um, field agriculture, they, they live and breathe off of leaf tissue tests because that allows you to know exactly what you need to put on and you don't need to overapply, which means you don't need to overspend on fertilizers. So when it comes to organic production, you can kind of look at it the same way where if you do a leaf tissue test maybe once every one or like maybe once or twice every growth cycle and just kind of track how your nutrients are being used in your media as you amend it during your mix, then you can know that, oh, I need to add a little bit more calcium sulfate or, hey, I need to add a little bit more nitrogen during this phase because my plants seem very hungry. So it would have to be, it's a very time intensive process if you don't have leaf tissue testing because you're just going off of symptoms in the plant and just kind of how you know that plant should grow. But if you, you can speed that up with, with, with leaf tissue testing and kind of really dial in an organic program, almost as good as a conventional agriculture salt program. You mentioned leaf tissue testing, but you don't mention soil testing. Is there a reason why you don't mention soil testing? So with leaf tissue testing, it's a little bit more of a consistent picture of what's in the soil because the plant is taking it up and distributing it as it sees fit. With soil testing, it's... It's tricky, especially in an organic media that you've amended, because if you take a core sample and if you do a soil test off of that, that may not be indicative of what's in that entire root zone. Also, how you irrigate and what the plants are sitting in, whether it's a pot or a bed, is a, a big difference on how it can affect nutrients either leaching through and out or being used up by the plant. So typically, we like to use the liquids that either go onto and off of a plant. And then at that point, you kind of think of the media as more like a, like a buffer, a sponge that's holding certain amounts. And with the right amendments, with the right CEC, you'd expect it to hold certain amounts of certain nutrients. So if you just measure what you're putting on with what you're putting out, even in an organic setting, you can find 
you, you're going to have a ratio of uptake, what's actually going into the plant, what's not coming out on the leachate over time. And then at that point, you can get a clearer picture as well. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Flipping back to synthetic nutrients, I have a, a viewer question here, which uh, is kind of funny. It's funny to me, at least, <laughs> which is uh, if base nutrients have phosphorus and potassium in them, are PK boosters really necessary? I know I had uh, a couple people actually say that PK boosters were just snake oil. It's it's mineral nutrition. So it's phosphorus and potassium. So is it necessary? Well, it really depends on your nutrient program. So in like, for instance, I would say that PK boosters for certain cultivars would be necessary, especially if you're running a very efficient fertigation program. Because in an efficient fertigation program, you're not over applying phosphorus and potassium, definitely not phosphorus at times where the plant doesn't need too much phosphorus. So you would want the phosphorus to be right within the ranges that you would expect to find in healthy leaf tissue tests. Now, certain cultivars may have a certain point at which they do have a higher than baseline need for phosphorus. And in those situations, having a PK boost that you can do for maybe one to two weeks of that plant's growth cycle when it really needs that phosphorus boost would definitely benefit. Because like I said before, you don't want that phosphorus to be a bottleneck in the plant's metabolism, especially in those important stages where there's a lot of secondary metabolisms happening and we're making all of our nice secondary metabolites that we like. So there is definitely a need for PK boosters. I mean, to tell you the truth, the most common PK booster that I that we've used in the ag world is just straight up monopotassium phosphate. You know, it's 05234. Doesn't get more PK boosty than that, really. There's different versions like dipotassium phosphate. Um, there's a product from ICL called PEC acid, which is basically a crystallized phosphoric acid. It's 06020. But there's plenty of mineral nutrition solutions in the ag industry for PK boosts because that requirement exists in plants. To have certain boosts of certain macronutrients during growth stages where you don't want to apply those high levels of those um, like phosphorus and potassium throughout the entire growth cycle because it's unnecessary. So yes, PK boosters do have a place, but they have a place in a well-programmed and a well-planned fertigation and fertilizer protocol. Yeah, I've heard from uh, several different people that a lot of these nutrient companies are putting an excess amount of phosphorus in there, you know, more phosphorus than the plant's going to need for its entire life. Are you seeing the same thing? Have, uh, have there been any companies that have kind of revised their formula since those findings have come out? I think as you look at the mineral salt um, programs that are coming onto the market and are being revised on the market, you I like um, there's a couple of nutrient brands that I've been watching, you know, for many years, and I've slowly seen the numbers of their macros and micros kind of evolve. And I think that's definitely where it's going, because a lot of these original salt recipes are based on like tomato formulas or cucumber formulas or cut flower formulas. None of them were specifically made for, you know, medicinal plants or, you know, specialty crops like this. So once the research is done, on what these specialty crops need, then the formulations of the nutrients will follow. You know, I'm really glad you mentioned that uh, about the feeding chart because uh, I remember back in the day when I first started, I was using Fox Farm Nutrients. And yeah. if you look at their feeding chart, you'll see like the recommended PPMs are just out of control. And a lot of people don't know this, but you had just mentioned it, is these formulas are created for a wide variety of plants, not just medicinal plants. So a lot of folks, you know, you often hear that it's recommended to start with a half dose according to what the feeding chart says. That's why. It's because that nutrient line is probably formulated for other plants besides medicinal ones. So right. I'm glad you mentioned that one. Absolutely. And, and newer cultivars or older cultivars, you know, like the plants are constantly evolving as we're growing them, you know, because they're not growing out in the wild. So their needs are going to evolve as well. So it's... A, that's why I think things like leaf tissue testing, leachate testing are so important to really know what the plant's eating, you know. Unless you see the plate after they're done eating, you don't really know what it liked or didn't like, you know. So that, that type of analytical testing gives us that window into what the plants really need and allows us to dial it in. That makes sense. Organic input. So I want to flip back to that. We're kind of going back and forth, back and forth here, but it's, it's all good. For the folks using organic inputs, what should they know prior to using them? 
One of the biggest things that I would recommend is know where your source material comes from. There's a lot of kind of smaller organic soil producers or media companies and you really want to get companies that have vetted where they're getting their forest materials from, where they're getting their peat from. And obviously you want to look to see if they're certified, if they have army certifications or any other sort of like governing body certification to show that they're organic. Um, barring that, it would really have to be like knowing the consistency of your product as well. Um, media, like I brought up, in, is, in a, is a good example. There could be a media company that makes fantastic organic media, but if their supplier for forest material drops out, then the media itself can change and be completely different. So finding consistencies in that type of an organic world is very challenging. Definitely not as challenge, or definitely more challenging than the mineral world where it's a, it's a chemical that has a certain number of these molecules and that molecule and that's it, you know, with an organic, there's so much involved in the production and decomposition time and all these things of the forest materials and the peat and the aging of that, that it's very hard for all those pieces to line up all of the time exactly the way that you expect and have expected it. So consistency would be the biggest driver of looking for a source of any sort of organic input. Like look at the historical data, see if they do uh, certificates of analysis, like quarterly, weekly, see if they'll just give them to you um, if you request them. Um, and yeah, and, and, and make sure that you're following up on it because a lot of the times people find a good organic input and then they keep using it without realizing that, you know, six months ago they changed this or that. That's why everything's everything in their grow has changed because of that change that the formulation that was in the formulation, but they weren't privy to it. So you really have to stay on top of your supply chain when you're using organic inputs and look for products that have known good consistency, known testing data, things like that. That's really good advice. I think a lot of people these days are using the organic blends. So the organic fertilizer, it's a blend of different amendments and they're typically doing the top dressing, right? That's the, the, the main way to do it is the top dress, or you can do the initial amending of the soil to begin. But when the plant is growing in the grow pot, they're top dressing that organic fertilizer and then they're watering that in. A lot of folks say that's the easiest way to do it and you can't overdo it. However, I'm hearing otherwise that you can overdo it. So can you overdo it with organics? Absolutely. You can absolutely over apply any fertilizer, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like food. You can overeat anything. You can even over drink water. And, and plants are the same way. You, it's harder, obviously, to overdose your plants on a certain, um, say, phosphorus because it takes so long typically for that to become available in a root zone. So unless you do some sort of an egregious over-application of something like that, then you're, you're typically not going to see toxicity symptoms or any sort of like ailments of the plant. But certain things like nitrogen, calcium, you know, those can be absolutely apparent when you do have toxicity. And the problem with organic agriculture too is remedying those problems. Say, you know, you can absolutely over-apply nitrogen. You, you put triple the amount of fish emulsion, you know, into the root zone. You start to get weird growth of like pathogenic cultures. You have this overabundance of nitrogen going into the plant. The leaves are getting leathery. Nitrogen cycles getting weird within the rhizosphere as well. So you can get those symptoms, but how do you alleviate that? In rock wool with nitrates, you just water through maybe 30 minutes for about four, like 30 minute cycles for about like, you know, four or five hours. And then you can be assured that that cube is well flushed enough that your next application of fertilizer will kind of reset the balance in that. With an organic, with a soil plot, with, you know, organic soils, it's a lot more difficult to alleviate those issues just because of the fact that it's being immobilized by the root zone's ecology, like the things living in there. It's being immobilized by the types of substrate that's in that. So it can't leave that substrate because it's stuck to the particles in it. Um, and generally, you'd have to use things like maybe potassium carbonate or activated charcoal or things like that to kind of deal with toxicities in your root zone and kind of help sequester sequester things. But you're never going to get the fast bounce back that you would in like a hydroponic situation. So with organic inputs, you can overuse them. You just have to make sure that you kind of do the lowest application possible and move up from there. 
like I said, with organic inputs and organic agriculture, it's really time intensive. You have to know your cultivars. And if you're trying to, if you're trying to blast through them and try to treat it like hydroponics, you're going to be going back and forth from either end. So yeah, start slow and moving up and not over applying would be the best technique with uh, organic agriculture. But yeah, you can definitely over apply that. That's no question. Got it. I want to flip things over to pH. pH is something that is closely monitored by those folks growing with synthetics. Uh, a lot of people that say you have to have that pH in that certain range in order for the plant to uptake. Now, on the organic side of things, you hear a majority of people saying they ignore pH completely. What are your thoughts on that? I think if they are growing organically with healthy root zones, their non-caring is well-founded. You know, the root zone ecology is there to provide the ideal conditions for that plant. And if it's set up correctly, it will. Even in hydroponics, we're starting to come around. Most people are starting to come around to the fact that it's not this insanely precise range that you have to be in it's a fairly wide range because even in an inert setting like rock wool you still have endogenous cultures like cultures in the air that will land in that root zone and as they live and die you know they acidify the area they do cellular respiration and push out co2 as well which goes into the substrate water and acidifies it so there's lots of pathways naturally for your media and root zone to balance its ph out Absolutely, you don't want to water outside of the range of maybe like six to seven or like five to like seven and a half. But within those ranges, typically the root zone can recover as long as it's not like a prolonged exposure to like a, a wild outlier pH. Um, when it comes to mineral nutrition, guys, you know, obviously the lad phosphoric acid or potassium hydroxide with organic production, you can still do pH adjustments um, pretty easily. You, you add things like dolomitic lime to the substrate if you need a little bit more basicity. Um, there's certain fertilizers like down to earth makes a good acid mix that's acidifying. Um, you can even add things like citric acid, which you can buy on listed um, and at a small rate with whatever nutrient or top dress formula to add a little bit of acid acidity. Sulfur products are a great way to add a little bit of acidity into your soil and kind of increase that root zone ecology. So yeah, you need to adjust your pH in an inert situation more and you definitely don't have to worry about it as much in a soil setting, but it is important, but just know that if you have a healthy root zone ecology and your plants are set up with a good substrate or media, then the pH will balance itself out as long as you're not wildly out of the range of typical like rainwater or natural water that we'd find standing on earth. So if somebody's water source is over 7.5 pH and they're growing with organic inputs, do you recommend that they pH down that water before doing the soil drench or could they just add in that water that's above 7.5 pH? That's a... That's a tricky question. You know, I, I want to know what else is in the water, you know, if it's bicarbonates or if it's sodium carbs that sodium bicarbonates or if it's just like standard, like typically if, if your pH is that high, then that also means that your um, total dissolved solids are high too. So I'd really want to take a look at the quality of your well water at that point. Um, if it's just like say calcium, and, uh, and, and other kind of beneficial kind of secondaries that are, and, and it's just a bunch of bicarbonate bringing it up. As long as you've amended your bed correctly, there should be no problem. If you know, like say the water has this amount of bicarbonate in it and you're gonna apply this much water to that land, then you should maybe know how much sulfur you wanna amend to that bed so that over the course of that watering year, you know, you're gonna have enough of a buffering capacity naturally built into that soil. Things, things like that are considerations you have to do before and after even the watering happens to answer something like that, I feel. Yeah, sorry to go roundabout and not answer your question. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I uh, That topic in particular is super controversial. I mean, I had uh, mentioned to lower the pH uh, in the past in one of my videos, and there was just an uproar of people growing organic. They're like, pH down doesn't exist in nature and you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of organic growers that they actually do have a water source above 7.5 and they're just putting in their soil and apparently not having issues. So I think I'd ask that, you know, get your thoughts on that one. Yeah, it really depends on the soil and how things, how you're watering, things like that. 
absolutely. Now, how about EC or PPM? This is another thing that when you're growing with synthetic nutrients, people tend to monitor it more closely than growing organics. Do you think when growing organics, you should just be completely hands off when it comes to the EC and PPM? Or do you think that should be monitored as well? You know, it's difficult in like row ag, things like that. But if you're doing organic agriculture in pots or in containers, then absolutely, I would monitor the uh, EC of what you're what you're putting on and what you're co- what's coming off of the plants. That's really going to tell you um, basically what's going to the plant because it's basically a simple math equation. You have this much nitrates, and then you put it on the plant, and then at the end when you're watering, you have this much nitrates. So maybe in the course of a couple of days, you you take the average of those numbers and you say like, oh yeah, so it's using this much nitrate. So that it, it can be just as useful in a soil world as it is in hydroponic. You can control it. The you can control the inputs a lot more precisely in hydroponics. Um, it's going to be a little bit more of a longer wave function when it comes to your um, corrections in organic agriculture. But the potential to make those corrections are still there. So monitoring your ECs is very important, especially if you're doing like you said, well water with like 7.5 pH. Because like I said, that probably means you have a ton of dissolved solids in there as well. And if you have a ton of dissolved solids, you want to make sure that you're not over applying the salty, probably calcium or maybe even sodium laden water onto an organic bed. So there's a lot of different little considerations when it comes to um, like the EC and what that EC is made of. And that's why we don't, that's why I typically don't recommend people use PPM as a measurement of nutrient concentration in their solution. Cause I mean, what scale is it? First of all, are you using the 500 or the 700 scale? What size particle? Like, and are you using a blue lab meter? Are you using an EC meter to measure that PPM? Cause all it's doing is taking the EC data and multiplying it by a number, you know? So the PPM is very hard to judge. The, the true measure of uh, like a PPM number would be to take that liquid, go get it analyzed and then find out exactly what's in it at what concentrations. So we don't like to use PPM. EC is is just electrical conductivity. How much salt is in this solution? How much ionic bonds got broken into this liquid? And that is, I think, a better indicator of plant health, plant health on the fly or root zone health on the fly. And then once your EC ranges are out of range, that's when you can really like take that water and get it tested. You know, ideally you would do periodic testing anyway, but that EC is going to be a simpler indicator. And if you know what's going on your plants and your plants are growing, then you can kind of assume that it's taking up at least the minimum of the balanced nutrition in order to grow. So you can kind of assume that what your leachate is going to come out as is typically going to be balanced. As soon as you start to see deficiencies or you start to see issues in uptake, you do that leachate test and if you're still within like a healthy leachate EC range of maybe 0.3 or 3 to 7, then you take that water into for testing and you go, oh, this is only 0.5 EC, but it's like literally all phosphorus in there. So we need to really dial back the phosphorus, dial everything else up a little bit, and then do a leachate test on a different pot a couple days later and then see where we're at at that point. And then you can kind of see that your number balancing out, your phosphate leachate goes down and it balances out with all your other macronutrients that you should expect to fall out in a healthy root zone. So yeah, EC measuring and monitoring absolutely is is critical in both regular conventional uh, hydroponics or in conventional like soil or uh, yeah, like container soil grows. It's harder to measure, of course, in like row agriculture. Usually you just... Um, you go at scale and you let it rip for those guys. You, you do soil tests beforehand, you make all the necessary calculations, you plan your applications, and yeah, you just set it on autopilot, you let it rip. But in a controlled environment where you can control your inputs, whether it's in soil and pots or rock wool or any inert substrate, having that EC input output readout is, is extremely helpful and critical in dialing in a nutrient program. Understood. Uh, for the record, I was born and raised on PPM measurements. Uh... Should uh, should probably switch over to EC. <laughs> Simpler, man. Just it's got two numbers. That's all you need, and then decimal decimal point sometimes. Uh, that's funny. I want to circle back to balance. I mean, we, we've mentioned that quite a few times throughout this episode, and we know that things need to be balanced in the medium. If you have an excess of some cations, it can lock out other cations. For example, right? What are some of the most common lockouts? 
that are out there? And how do people resolve these lockouts and prevent them from happening? It's, um, it really depends on how you're growing. So if you're in a hydroponic inert media, a lot of these like lockout or um, imbalance situations can be really corrected on the fly just by flushing the substrate out. Um, rock wool, of course, is going to be the easiest or some sort of uh, you know expanded glass. But even in cocoa coir or even in peat, you can you can flush it. You can flush your substrates through and kind of reset and start reapplying your um, base formula to kind of reset that media. When it comes to, like I mentioned earlier, in a soil substrate, it's a little bit harder because you have different particulates that hold on to different ions. They promote different cultures growing in the media, which can also hold on to different nutrients. So when it comes to maybe preventing a lockout or, or trying to at least diagnose a lockout, one thing that we usually recommend is look at your environmental data first. So a lot of the times we've seen lockouts can happen from environments being too cold, too wet, uh, not enough light, things like that. If all of your environmental data is good, then at that point, I, you, and at the same time, you probably want to dial your nutrient program just back, just simply back, and then start doing leachate testing. Once you dial your nutrient program back, then you can kind of be assured that you're not locking anything out, and you're, that increased volume of water is maybe flushing out something that maybe have, may have been accumulating. And then at that point, you can kind of get your leaf tissue tests or kind of get a baseline idea of what's in your substrate as you're applying new fertilizer solution and, and see if that deficiency comes back. A lot of the times we've seen like deficiencies arise from fertigation techniques, like how the fertilizers are being applied more so than the concentration of the fertilizers themselves, especially nowadays with all of these formulations kind of getting dialed in more and more. It's not like um, growers are putting too much calcium and it's locking out the phosphorus. It's more about like growers are putting too much of everything and they're watering too many times a day. And so the, the root zone is either waterlogged or their watering periods are too far apart and they have too hard of a dryback. And that can really kind of upset the uptake kind of balance within the root zone as it prunes itself and has to grow back new new uh, shoots. So the, the general health of the plant is going to kind of like, in my opinion, comes down to knowing the baseline of how that cultivar grows and then knowing that, you know, you're applying a certain amount of blank. So if you dial that back, then you can't be over applying anything. And then from there, like for me, I would do the leaf tissue testing. If that's not available at that point, you'd see if that deficiency persists and if other deficiencies come arise, you dial your nutrient program back up and then you'd, you'd see if it was an environmental factor or if it was in fact a nutrient factor. If it's very obvious, like one thing that I've seen very obviously is magnesium. Um, you start to get that intravenal chlorosis on the leaves, things like that. And a lot of the times guys will increase their magnesium and it's just doesn't get, doesn't improve. And then you find out like they don't ever have dryback in their root zones. They're using like a, a plastic pot without any drainage. So it, a lot of the times we've seen a lot of these um, lockout issues go back to environmental factors and just growth environment of the plant. If you do have a nutrient kind of imbalance in hydro, you usually flush and reset. In soil, you have to amend with yeah it's it's difficult in soil you'd have to add if it's a product that can be sequestered by activated uh, charcoal you can do that barring that heavy flushes with water work too but you know you're going to stress the plant out a lot doing that whereas in a inert media typically you get faster dryback so it's not going to stress the plant out too much i hope that answers that question <laughs> yeah lots of good information for sure one thing actually made me think of another question, which is you mentioned environment and temperature. Can you talk to us about how the temperature, the varying of temperature, you know, whether the temperature be too high or too low, how that impacts nutrition and, and nutrient uptake? Absolutely. Like, you know, this is a big thing that happened when everyone switched from HIDs to LEDs. They've realized they had to change their nutrient programs. They had to change their room parameters because the rooms are less hot. So heat in and of itself is energy too. So 
Not only do you need the light energy to drive photosynthesis, but of the kinetic energy from the heat of the room moves the water molecules in the room and helps those processes out as well. You know, it's almost like uh, a catalyst in all of those processes. So heat definitely plays a factor in the transpiration rate. It triggers stress re responses and, and kind of growth responses in the plant. So if your rooms are too cold or if they're honestly too cold or too hot, you're going to have interruptions in, in the metabolism of the plant, which is going to interrupt the uptake of the plant. And once you get an interruption in the uptake, you're continually applying. So that's when you start to get the issues of if this plant is locked out because it's dry for half of the day and you start to keep applying more, it's not going to use up all of those nutrients during that day while the light is hitting it. So like the environmental factors, your soil moisture content and, you know, the temperature of the room have a huge key to uh, have a huge role to play in the nutrient uptake and transpiration ability of your plants. So, yeah, like I said, if you're if you're too cold, the plants really don't have enough energy to move a lot of water through. Uh, also, the water itself has, is low energy, so it doesn't really want to move up and through the plant as well. If it's too hot, then you have too much water transpiring out. A lot of the times, if it's too hot, your root zones get um, in uneven dryback or too much dryback, and that can stop the uptake of water, which stops the uptake of nutrients, which also at that point starts to get uh, accumulation in your root zone, and then your EC starts to spike. Once your EC spikes and your EC gets too salty, then the root zone is too salty for uptake. That affects your uptake immensely. That's when you start to see your really spindly plants with the tiny golf balls just going down the, the stem. When it comes to medicinal plants or like in a, in a tomato plant, you get these tiny small fruits, you know. So the EC controls a lot of how your plant grows. And the EC is really a function of the water content in the soil too. So the water content itself is kind of um, affected by the environmental conditions like the temperature and the irrigation frequency, things like that. So yeah, your environmental factors, like, like I said, when it goes back to deficiencies or nutrient problems, we always circle first to your environment to see if your environment is good. If that's not the case, then a lot of the times changes in the environment will correct or increase the uptake within the root zone and then they can get back onto their kind of nutri their standard nutrition program as as they planned it. So what's the ideal temperature range to keep your environment? You know, it's cultivar dependent, um, especially for medicinal plants, but it's anywhere within the ranges of like 65 all the way up to 85. Um, you know, that magic VPD number comes in when it comes to those types of outlier temperatures. You really want to monitor your humidity in those temperatures. And again, cultivar dependent. Certain cultivars do great in 65. Certain cultivars don't grow in 65. Certain cultivars stunt out and they don't grow at 85. Certain cultivars veg out and bush like crazy at 85. So I would say it's definitely cultivar dependent, but um, the ranges for like our most common medicinal plants would be anywhere from like 65 to about 85. And life cycle plays a huge part in that, absolutely, because because temperature also you're you're trying to mimic the natural temperature cycle in, for an annual plant. So of course, in those earlier spring and summer months, the veg months, you'd have higher temperatures, and in the flower senescence months and the harvest months, you definitely have cooler temperatures and the the inner um, metabolisms within the plant are triggered by those changes in temperatures as well. So it's important to consider the temperature shift within a growth cycle of medicinal plants as well as just the baseline temperature. That's good to know. So there's a different type of feeding that I want to touch on. You know, a lot of people will mix in their synthetic nutrients into water, then do a soil drench. Other folks will do a top dressing of organic inputs, for example and then they'll water them in. However, there's another way to go about feeding, which is foliar feeding. Talk to us about how foliar feeding works and what type of foliar feeding can growers do? So foliar feeding is basically trying to directly apply mineral nutrition to the parts of the plant that seemingly need it, that can't get translocated from other parts of the plant, or it's not getting from the root zone. You know, I we definitely have I definitely have an opinion about foliar applications of mineral nutrition, especially. Um, it's kind of like uh, it's not something that I believe growers should lean on for their nutrition program. 
it's definitely a just a general part of any part of crop cultivation. But it's it's kind of like um, you you'd want to feed a child a fully balanced nutrition from the get go into his mouth. You don't want to feed him only macaroni and cheese and then he gets scurvy and then you got to take him to the doctor to get a direct injection of vitamin C every month. And that's kind of if you if you consider having a constant foliar feed program, that's kind of the type of nutrition program you're planning out for your plants. You want that nutrition to come. Because we're not growing orchids or, you know, like uh, plants that are growing up in tree canopies. We're growing plants with full root zones and root systems. So we want to deliver their nutrition th that way, the, the, the more conventional way, the way that is kind of a pathway laid out by the plant, rather than using foliar applications a lot of the times. Foliar application, applications would come when that baseline nutrition program seems to have a deficiency and when you specifically identify that deficiency, whether it is uh, calcium or magnesium or this or that, or uh, zinc, for example, is actually common in medicinal plants. If you find those specific deficiencies, then yeah, a foliar application is an absolute powerhouse tool to get that mineral nutrition directly onto those areas of the plant where that particular nutrient can't get translocated up into um, from the other tissues of the plant. But barring that, you know, foliar applications, especially on an, like an ornamental plant or a cut flower product like medicinal plants typically are, you want to reduce any application of any product to the plant, especially after influences have set, after, after flowers are there, because, you know, that's, that is the end product. And anything that you add exogenously can typically degrade or denude the quality of that product. So you don't want to apply as you want to reduce applications as much as possible. That's why beneficial insects or beneficial mites are so great. They allow you to have good pest control of under over threshold numbers without any applications of sprays or anything. And there's no possible possible problem of frass or anything like that. So that's why I think BCAs are taking over on the IPM side. And when it comes to foliar applications, we're in my opinion, seeing less products market themselves as foliar products and a lot of products kind of try to roll all of that value into their mineral nutrition. There is, um, there are certain foliar products, especially amino acids that we found that are not part of a mineral nutrition program, but do actually have added benefits. A lot of the times um, we see it a lot in turf or in, when I was in the ag world, we saw it a lot in turf. Like... Um, there's a certain amino, proline, for example, you spray that on grass and that helps trigger pressure and all the blades stand straight up, you know. So we're finding that there are other products that we can apply to the plants foliarly that would give the benefits of that we couldn't really get through uh, a nutrition program in the root zone. And those are the products that I'd probably suggest um, if you wanted to do a foliar program, you roll those into a foliar program with some base IPM products. But also know that foliar products work best with adjuvants. So if you don't have like a spreader sticker, uh, like an organosilicone um, adjuvant, if you, if you don't have like even like an acid chelator or something like that, say the pH of your foliar spray is off or you're not agitating. As you, like there's a lot of considerations that you have to lock in for a foliar program to be truly effective. Once those things are locked in and you've truly found a product that works best as a foliar ap application, good on you, go nuts. But in my opinion, foliar nutrition is, is um, yeah, it's a shot in the arm when it should have been just part of the meal. Interesting. Yeah, I think the only time I ever really do foliar feeding is when I have magnesium deficiency and I'm in veg. Yeah. Like I don't spray in flour, but magnesium deficiency in veg, I use Epsom salt, so magnesium sulfate. <laughs> put that into water, spray the plants, and that helps with the magnesium deficiency. Uh, I do know some people who will do a foliar feeding of silica. Not so much that it goes into the plant that way, but I believe that it helps with some resistance to powdery mildew in particular. I don't have too many details on that one. And I know some folks that will use, the actually uh, foliar feed compost tea, so for micro purposes. Yeah, to, to, to get those lactobacillus cultures in there, get those healthy cultures on there. Absolutely, that makes sense. As long as you're doing it at, at a uh, kind of a, a sane rate that really doesn't affect the quality of the plant. Um, silica, obviously, that's been done for quite a while. Um, that's That directly, if, if it's small enough, can kind of 
go through into the plant and be absorbed foliarly. And I was just going to say, with the magnesium sulfate too, you can foliar that, but you know, you could, you could simply top dress a little bit too, and then you'd probably get the same results in about three to four days. And uh, you can even add a little bit more to your fertigation program as kind of a last step amendment to the batch tank. Um, it'll melt down easily, easily enough if it's magnesium sulfate, and it really doesn't affect your PPMs too much. So that that's something that you could do as well. So there, like I said, there's other ways to to get those benefits without risking someone maybe doing a improper application or over applying something fully early. Good points. So we are coming up towards the end of the episode. I wanted to give you an opportunity to let us know what else should gardeners know about plant nutrition? Is there anything that we didn't cover in this episode that you think we should cover? You know, one thing that I, that I've kind of wanted to scream from the rooftops a lot is, um, you know, your mineral nutrition, your, your nitrates, your phosphorus, your potassium, that is the same molecule, regardless of bottle, salt, bran, country of origin, all of that. So it really comes down to understanding what you put on your plants more than kind of, in my opinion, um, trusting a product at this point. Back in the day, there was no information about medicinal plants, no information about certain specialty crops that we could go off of and have kind of historical data to, to see if we're within ranges for certain things. Now that that information is being found out in places like Canada and like even here in the U.S., that type of information needs to be applied. You know, like like I said, I come from the ag industry. I come from the ag world and and there's not a cotton farmer in the world that would overspend on a nitrogen molecule. You know, they, they, sometimes they make, you know, like less than a hundred bucks per acre on their cotton. So it's like, it's, it's tough out there in the ag world. And I think that is also a really good point in sustainability too. We have to make sure that we're not following the same mistakes of ag. And from the get go, we're trying to be as efficient as possible with our nutrient delivery so that we're not setting a bad example. Like, it needs to be done properly with the right science. And that starts with people understanding just the basic science of how plants take up mineral nutrition, how what the basic needs are for plants, you know. Very similar to us. They need three big things and then all the vitamins. So we just need to find the right balance of those and then find the right way to deliver that. And uh, yeah, we shouldn't be too hung up on brands and stuff. We should just try to find the best way to mishmash everything to make things work and try to be the most efficient as possible. I think that's some really, really good advice. So let's wrap things up. How can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Uh, I should be, you, you should see me in a couple more um, Can of Cribs and Deep Roots episodes on the Growers Network YouTube channel. Um, definitely helping them out with a lot of that stuff. I'm helping them on the back end um, with their plant science info. You can check me out directly at canacribs.org. If you click on the consulting tab, um, you'll see a little bio and a little picture of me. Uh, if anyone has any questions about cultivation or cultivation at scale, there's a form that they could fill out and we'd be happy to answer any questions directly too. So, Awesome. Well, this has been an insightful episode. I'm super glad that you decided to sit down and talk with me. I learned so much from this. You Thanks explain things on. very well, very, very uh, beginner friendly manner, in my opinion. And um, hope I can have you on again in the future because I think uh, we can continue this conversation or even go towards some other areas we have a lot of knowledge of, such as IPM. Sure. Yeah. I'd be happy to come back on. Yeah. Just ask me anytime, Chris. Sweet. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode, and I would love for you to tune into future episodes. I'll definitely have a link to your Instagram or to your website or something down in the YouTube description section below so folks can go down there and visit you pretty easily. Thank you all for tuning in, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Peace out, everyone.